and Linda Potter are passionate food producers from the Ellsworth district, 20 minutes east of Waipawa in the Central Hawks Bay. They operate Waipapa, a mixed livestock operation encompassing deer, sheep and beef with the growing timber component. Linda grew up at Munga Ehea, Munga Hea, sorry, station in Tolaga, where her family farmed sheep and beef for 32 years. Evans family still farm Mara Kakaho district, a mixture of bulls and trade lands. The Potters have four daughters at various stages of life. Today they will present a journey of common sense. Cheers for that. Um, oh, technology challenged already. <coughs> so we'll just start by um, playing a short video that gives you a, a bit of an idea of the sort of country that we farm. Hopefully if I push this. Music's fine, that's good. We'll get a stop. From a sack, a 99 cent heart attack. I got a pound in head and an aching back, and the camel's buried in a big straw stack. I'm gonna live where the green grass grows, watch my corn pop up in rows. Every night be tucked in close to you. Raise our kids where the good Lord's blessed, point our rocking chairs towards the west, and plant our City park. I don't know who my neighbors are. There's bars on the corners and bars on my heart. But I'm gonna live where the green grass grows. Watch my corn pop up in rows. So the music was just a little bit of a, um, I suppose, reflection of my sense of humour when you're farming a dry environment. <laughs> <coughs> and obviously this year we are quite green. And um, that's not normal. Well, it is normal most every second year or third year, but um, yeah, it is a harsh environment, it's hill country, and it is summer dry. So the journey of common sense is basically, I think, just telling you our story um, and our journey as we became national ambassadors for sustainable farming and growing. Um, I don't call it rocket science, it's just, like I say, common sense, and I don't think common sense is extinct, but you guys can decide that by the time we finish. Uh, welcome everyone. This is um, us, this is our family, our girls, our old school at Leah's a primary school teacher in Hamilton. Number two, Sarah, is here, eternal student at Massey, now doing a PhD in biochem. And number three, Caitlin, is at Napier Girls in her last year, and she's heading off to be a teacher too in Hamilton. And Hannah, our youngest, is in her second year at high school at Napier Girls with, um, yeah, who knows. <coughs> um, we've always been involved with our community, school boards and parents and friends and sports teams, etc. And now we're still involved, even though the kids have left primary, with um, dog trials and horse sports and hockey and things. Um, we're also quite involved with the deer industry, helping with greenhouse gas modelling and environmental handbooks, 
and hosting groups such as um, MFE and MPI. Evan is also the local chair of the, the um, chair of the local Deer Farmers Association. Um, we take a holistic approach to business and equally value all four pillars. One can't be at the expense of another. Financial, social, animal and environmental sustainability. <coughs> um, we've had a long-standing relationship with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. We sort of consider them to be like an accountant or a bank manager. They've got a fantastic source of knowledge and the, all the um, connections you get with people and specialist skills and things. Right, so that, that's us. Um, if you forget about the pink and the green area to start with, we purchased um, 566 hectares back in 97, so the pine tree boom had just sort of eased a bit. It was effectively the worst house on the street. Um, ran as basically one paddock. Infrastructure was a good house and a good woolshed, and fences that had once dissected the place, but um, yeah, lying on the ground. The big green patch out the side is an 1,800 acre block of forestry. We had 2k of boundary with them originally, and a k of that was lying on the ground. So. Um, pretty extensive. We've added the pink block in 2015, another 74 hectares, and then uh, the green block in 17. So the purchases have been quite timely and they've just squared us up a bit and added a slightly different class of land. Um, so that red line through the centre is where the Silver Range runs, and that's currently, as the CHB District Council redoes its um, plan, going to be classed as an outstanding natural feature. But if we can draw up this, that line there, going across there, is the Hastings District and CHB Hastings District boundary. So the pink and green are not outstanding, but the other side is outstanding. Um, so that has a few management headaches. It seems a bit ambiguous, but hey, that's the life we have to live and the things we have to deal with. Um, on the bottom side, this side of the red line is all um, mudstone sedimentary soils and on the top side is all sandstone. And they have very different uh, management characteristics and erosion problems and so that's sort of part of how we run the place that's all been taken into consideration. Uh, this is the farm overview. Um, all those figures and numbers can be easily read off there. So what I'd add is that in 1999, um, the council, that's Hawke's Bay Regional Council, were offering, I think it was for about $500 of my money to come and do a soil conservation plan. Best $500 I've ever spent in my life. Effectively, that's the same as a farm plan nowadays, missing the nutrient budget. So it gave you a fantastic stock take of what you had, all your physical resources. We had a three year plan of what we were gonna do next. It was done in consultation at um, farm level. And I think Simon Stokes, who was the guy that did it, spent about the best part of a week on farm poking around all the places. A lot of the ideas have impl been implemented and we'd probably call it our cornerstone document for development. Um, so yeah, that was something that we did that was really, really good. It took us about six years to retire 120 hectares, which was a big gully system and ran right through the centre, predominantly class eight land with a small bit of class seven in it. Um, just a management nightmare, made perfect sense to us. Not so much to my neighbours that watched with interest. Um, maybe I've had the last laugh, maybe not, we'll see. Um, and then we also decided that it was a good partnership to do into QE2 because in perpetuity that's going to leave that um, as protected and it's become a great, I suppose, uh, asset to the farm in some ways and it probably stood out in that um, short video. Uh, fertility was non-existent, 
would have been a great place to go organic if the P level's red. They read about three or four. Um, what else do we do? Yeah, so like I said, insufficient fencing to, to manage or farm. We really did, I would call it ranch, where we put stock, they then went where they wanted. Um, and I guess the biggest plus for us was it was a good size farm in terms of area and it had the main assets done so anything that we invested was going to give a good return. So that was the main drivers for buying the place. Oh, that and severely limited with equity. So. Um, this is a view from on top of the Silver Range. Um, it's a pretty cool walk to go and have a look from, sort of see see all around Hawke's Bay. Um, that's a sort of um, overview of what we'd like to achieve, a park-like look. But it also helps us um, look at where we might need some more shade and shelter for stock or, or where erosion areas are. It shows us uh, all the increased biodiversity that we've created. So this area from that tank up to where we're standing is significant. Below that is not. And obviously that's the gorge system that's, like I say, pretty much class eight, a little bit of seven. Cows used to try and fly, reaching the flax in the winter. <laughs> Defied gravity, not very well. Um, that sort of carry on. So I mean, it just made sense. And then the other benefit of running a fence right around the edge of this thing in partnership with Council and QE2 is you've got a main um, piece of infrastructure to work off and get subdivision really, really quickly. And having to be innovative, um, short of money, but young and plenty of energy, we could um, get a source of funding, do the work ourselves, and actually um, get a bit further ahead a lot quicker. So in terms of the cattle policy, that's effectively what we're now doing. Um, we have until recently read about 300 Frisian bull calves annually. And part of that's been running bull beef at home, and part of that's been um, rearing for family so that they can carry on farming because we have an ageing family that have still got their hand in the game but um, used us as a good way to make life easier. Um, we've also had dairy beef cross steers and they just are a lot slower maturing. Our country is obviously quite hard so this is a, a way of um, shortening the time frame that the animals are on hand and it works well with um, obviously the greenhouse gases and things that are coming at us. So it's all an evolving um, system really for us. Sheep, that's the, the guts of the, of the sheep policy. Originally it was um, 2,400 Romney ewes I think at the start, keeping hoggets, just a traditional system. And that's where we've pretty much ended up. Just everything terminal, get rid of them as fast as we can before it gets dry. Because dry is always going to happen. And in the last sort of five years Probably more have been going store for the money that's been offered in early November um, uh, that we just can't keep up with. We'd either sell them in the autumn or at lower weights for less money. Um, yeah, so that's been working for us. The ironic thing about the cattle policy is we've actually come full circle because we had a breeding herd originally of cows and then we thought it had not enough flexibility. So we've tried steers and other things, but. Um, all the other policies were starting to suffer without the feed grooming. So the cows do a great job in grooming. This is probably one of the key drivers, the, the velveting operation. Um, and venison was also a strong part of it um, in bed with first light. But obviously venison's been a little bit sick for the last couple of years. It's um, good to hear that it's on the rapid rise. But the uh, velveting operation allows a pretty high value system be matched to a pretty crappy class of land, I suppose. Um, not outstanding figures, there's, there's plenty of people doing doing a hell of a lot better than um, the five kilos, but uh, if you can maintain five kilos on average across your three year old and up, that's that's pretty good return. Um, about 30 cents a kilo dry matter that you do us across, that's the hinds and the, and the stags, so that's, that's not too shabby. Um, 
Um, tree planting. We're planting trees today actually. We've got some pines and some uh, deodars <laughs> going in. About 10 hectares of pines and 3 hectares of deodars. Um, we annually, annually plant about three to 4,000 natives <coughs> and we plant I don't know, about 500 ourselves, take the kids and do it. But um, yeah, we don't have time to plant the whole lot so we usually employ somebody to help. And then about 150 to 200 poplars every year. Um, this year we're going to try rooted poles with the um, climate and apparently it's got quite a good higher survival rate than what we've had. Um, we have already got some pine established, <laughs> about 20 hectares. Um, and then we're also, other than the other ones that we're putting in, we're going to put in some gums and some redwoods and different things and some other native stands. Um, yeah, with coming from Tolliger, I'm not too in love with pines with all the wrecking that they do, coming down onto your beaches and things, so I'm quite keen on putting a few different species here and there. You don't have to have the same thing all the time. But they do, um, yeah, make some income so you can plant the rest. You all notice the wee, that's the muggins up here with the pointer that's doing the planting and someone else is taking the photo. <laughs> um, this is where I'd rather be instead of doing housework. I'm usually there. <laughs> Probably rather be there than here too. <laughs> yeah, would be. Um, I'm trying to grow what we plant. So I even built me a nice shade house this year for Christmas and I have my greenhouse that I fill up all the time. Um, I just go out tootling out whenever I go to work in little bags and pick up seeds and things like that. So yeah, just learning how to grow from Mr. Google, really. <coughs> um, yeah, we do use labour to plant and release, and, and then local high school students and, and our kids to spread digs because they're not worth anything around all the trees, and it helps with a um, bit of fertiliser and weed suppressant. Anyone with teenage kids, spreading digs around the natives is a great way to limit cell phone usage. <laughs> <laughs> That's punishment. I mean, not punishment. <laughs> And um, yeah, eco sourcing of seeds is great, except when she disappears when you're meant to be drafting. So. Um, this is our um, wee wetland where Evan spends a bit of time <coughs> on certain weekends of the year. Monitoring waterfowl. <laughs> um, but just having a little chat about our journey with the Balance Awards, um, we did enter first in 2012 and didn't get past the first round of judging, but um, enjoyed the feedback and things. <coughs> um, we had a sort of a glimpse of what other people were doing and went to field days and things. So it did give us a bit of inspiration. Um, yeah, we sort of got the idea that we were on the right track with what we're doing by seeing other people and, and what they're on, on about. I guess, um I think it was 2019, we've been quite involved with the deer industry, doing uh, industry body projects and, and things like that, and we were hosting a group, and this is a vantage point not too far away, easy to get to, and we're standing there, and I sort of had my back to that, talking to like you guys, and someone goes, wow, look at that, and I sort of just glanced over my shoulder, looked at them, thought, in my head, thinking, what the frig are they on about? But anyway, um, carried on doing my thing, and... It was probably a week later we came home and I don't know if it was the light or what the frigate was, but um, looked out and a light bulb sort of came on and I'm like, ah, yeah, okay, I get it, it's not a bad picture. Um, pretty good place to work. So um, we had had our arm twisted and, and we entered the uh, Deer Industry Biannual um, Environmental Awards and we surprisingly given the competition that was there, uh, won the Elworthy Premier Award for, for the deer industry and um, yeah that was sort of the beginning of a, another part of the journey really. But I mean I think as one of the guys from Wellington said that's, that's a pretty cool picture showing mixed species, mixed land use um, and everything sort of seamlessly flowing together um, and that's what I believe our landscape should look so look like more so than a monoculture of grass or pines or, or should I swore again, you know, pines.
Oh, I get to say some more. What did I say on that? Oh, okay. Um, it also, well, not all the same, it also makes Evan actually look back at what he's actually achieved rather than he's always just, no, we're going to go and do this. Got to go and do this. So, so same photo, different time of the year. And, and Linda's right. Um, I think 20 years ahead, Linda thinks now. And having that tug of war is fantastic because um, if you're only thinking one way or the other, it's probably detrimental long term. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good representation of this season, um, one in ten. So in, in 2020, we um, threw our hat back in the ring for the East Coast region, and um, yeah, went up to Gisborne and managed to walk away with the regional supreme winner, uh, which was a little bit mind-blowing given that you go up there and you sit in a room and you've got five or six contestants, and they're all pretty sharp. You get a few awards and you watch someone else win, I think four or five awards, and you're sort of thinking, oh, well, it was a nice attempt, and then they read out your name, and yeah, the rest is history, really. So um, yeah, it did show that perhaps we're on the right path. Oh, this is um, right on the top of the bony range of the, <laughs> of the range. It was a um, family walk, I think it was like boxing day, wasn't it? Yeah, admiring the outstanding scenery. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, after winning the East Coast, region, we went to the National Showcase in Wellington, and another round of judging and things first, which was um, pretty cool for the judges that come to see you, and um, then you have a half hour formal interview with a panel of five people. Um, the next day you do a presentation with all your fellow regional winners, um, and that's a really cool day, it's the highlight of the whole thing I think meeting a whole lot of like-minded individuals, sharing your stories for the whole day, it just sort of whizzes by. Um, yeah, and we didn't think that we'd be the winners though, at the end of it. No. Uh. So, I, I might come across as a little bit tongue-in-cheek or negative about an outstanding natural feature, but I don't actually have a problem with the outstanding natural feature. That, that concept's great. My problem is that it's been a desktop application done in Wellington, or wherever, in Havelock North actually in this instance, without any ground proofing. <coughs> and so the line for what's outstanding and what's not goes a bloody long way down that hill. So that's one lot of legislation. Then the next lot of legislation is saying that I've got to minimise my greenhouse gases, offset carbon and all this sort of stuff. This is our worst country, and we've got our hands tied. So that's probably my issue. If the if the outstanding natural line came down 100 metres, 150 metres, you would remain, keep the integrity of the hill, it would achieve everything that I think they were trying to achieve, and it would still allow me to farm and have options. So that's probably where my bone of contention comes. So yeah, in, in Wellington you do get to sit in a room with lots of cool people, and then um, because it's a sponsor event, you have to go and do this um, real swanky event. So you're dressed up to the nines, paraded around like a prize turkey. Um, they ask you patsy questions, which is some people's cup of tea and not others. Um, and then we were yeah, chilling out, drinking red wine, and just about spat it out when our names were read out, because we'd worked out who was going to win, and it sure as hell wasn't us. Um, but look, it's a cool event, it's a different environment, and um, you make some pretty good contacts, and then it does open a few doors, I suppose, um, for things going forward. And the best part of it is it's farmers authentically telling their stories on their terms, which is what we all need to do. So, unashamedly, all you buggers that are farming, that haven't entered the awards, throw your hat in the ring. You're never going to be ready, and there's never a better time. Worst case scenario is you'll get a nice dinner and someone will give you a bit of advice that you can choose to ignore. <laughs> Pretty much like a normal day, really, isn't it? Right, what's that one? Okay, um, yeah, so that's basically our philosophies, um, how we try and try and operate. I don't know, are we running out of time? No, we're good, aren't we? Yep, so we'll better move it along. Yeah, I mean, we basically came with a team of dogs and, and sort all else, plenty of energy, probably didn't really know 100% what we're getting into, but um, thinking about some of the things that are set up upstairs, um, like don't worry about the boxing, just pour the concrete, or well, our line is, doesn't matter where you start, just start. So, 
just get on with it and, and, and sort of get into it, really. So I'll put this one up here because um, Hawke's Bay uh, HBRC have been a big part of our journey right from the start. We've, we've well and truly um, hooked up with them. Um, I've covered the soil conservation plan. Um, we did a farm-based soil and LUC mapping program and that's been instrumental in making decisions. Uh, we've got a water monitoring site at the moment that went in the last 12 months, suspended sediment and um, water level because the hardware catchment is a bit of a um, sediment problem in the Tuki. And then we get on to right tree, right place, which I wanted to mention today. Um, and that's, I guess, the overarching concept of that is pairing resources. What did I write? Pairing resources. is pairing in the resources with um, people that um, can get better outcomes. So I don't like the name, but the concept's fantastic. And the, and the name is um, only a problem because it's been pushed around Parliament so often that people think pine trees. And they're right um, to a point, but um, pine trees are only part of it. So I, I go back a little bit further. Every five years we complete a business review. We pull our system apart, analyse everything, work out where we're making our money, where it's costing us money. So we gave the um, person doing it the parameters of maintaining EFS and reducing workload. And they identified that protein production wasn't going to do that for us. So then I had to tell Linda the bad news <coughs> that um, perhaps we weren't going to be running as many sheep as we used to and that we needed to change change something. They threw in timber and this basically allowed us to improve productivity of the poorest land. And um, long term that's a bloody good thing and it offers resilience to our business. Right at that time, that saying about timing is everything, um, Hawke's Bay Regional Council were looking to put in place this concept that they were working with, working on. And so we are currently the pilot project. Um, we're going through the space of working out all the little kinks, um, and there are a few. We're asking questions that they don't have answers for at this stage, but hopefully they will, because if we can roll it out, it's effectively going to provide a turnkey uh, style um, plan that you can rock in with the land, and someone else is going to front up with the coin and give you a pathway that you can choose or choose not to to follow and basically get a better business proposition. So roughly we're looking at removing another 90 hectares from protein production and putting it into timber or carbon sequestration. Um, initial modelling over the three to four year establishment time frame will basically slowly take out 400 stock units from our operation, and it's it's targeting that stuff that's only running three to four animals a hectare, so low kilos of dry matter and steeper stuff. I think if we go back into here, we've got no SNAs on the hill. It's it's a ONF, which is an outstanding natural feature. SNAs are all in the gully, so this is a basically all pasture up here. There's there's no bush, a little bit of martinuka, um, but this in here is. Um, not in it because there's the, that there's the boundary line between Hastings, which is over here, and this is CHB. So that side of the fence is not outstanding, so we can do what we like. Um, none of it's red zoned, so we can plant it in pines quite happily or any other timber species. So what do you mean by it's outstanding? Can you just explain that rule? So under the RMA councils, I think I've got this right, are obliged to um, Identify areas that have outstanding that are an outstanding natural feature and protect them for future generations. So the Silver Range, which is this sandstone ridgeback, runs maybe 5k in length, and it's been classed as an outstanding natural feature or landscape, and so it's going to be protected from um, erosion. Uh, sorry, not from erosion, from subdivision, from planting trees, and from 
um, earthworks. So you can't change it. It's got to look like it does. Because it's pretty. It shimmers like silver when it rains. I haven't found the silver. Um, so initially this plan is probably going to affect the EFS by 11k deficit uh, in the short term. But we've taken into account, well we haven't taken into account, reduced weed control, um, maintenance on fences, reduced fert, fert usage, better management control or improved um, infrastructure that we can work off. So that's the plan of what we're hoping to achieve. So the, that's the boundary line between Hastings and CHB. This is the outstanding natural feature along here. These will be blocks of pines in here. So they're hidden from view for us because Linda doesn't like looking at pines. Down here we have a mix of uh, deodars which have been planted today. There's three hectares going in there with natives along the gully or along the uh, ephemeral watercourse. There's gums, redwoods, cedars, or oh, cypress, sorry, and then native right along here. That's the plan. And then, uh, so long term, we're working on, our modelling today tells us conservatively that the fines should do about $800 a hectare a year, and that carbon is going to bring in about 20, just under 26 k at $65 a hectare in the next 16 years using a five year rotation philosophy. Interestingly enough, in that area, which is QE2, because Brown is the QE2 that runs right through the gorge, that was a 120 hectare project, that, 120 hectare project that we fenced off over six years. We have 20 hectares of that in the e ETS, and it's doing $1,000 a hectare now. So that's just out of carbon at $75, I think, today, or $76, whatever it's running at. Um, so we're clearly better off financially and a bit more resilience, and it's cutting down our workload long term. The risks, unknown markets in the future for both timber and carbon, and usually you only have one harvest in your lifetime, plus changes to government legislation, I guess. Uh, benefits are maximising um, the land use, or production off the land use. Um, it's a chance to improve biodiversity and soil erosion outcomes, so it's win-win for the council, which is probably the main driver for them, but they're also very practical in the sense that they, it's got to be fiscally viable for the landowner. Um, potentially, I sort of see right tree, right place as a way of reducing whole farm afforestation. Um, so I guess my challenge is that we've got to look at farming or uh, land use not just as protein production. There's other options. Um, okay, so quickly that's, that's us, what we're trying to do in the future. Um, plant for aesthetics, sort of leave a bit of a park. And then I'll just jump to the summary because this is probably more, more us. Um, I'd suggest that you complete a stock take of your land resources, work out what's profitable, what's not, possibly dial things back a little bit and um, consider alternative land uses. Um, there's potential for things that generate cash other than just grass. Uh, timber, carbon, tourism, honey. I mean, we were just down south, Lake Brunner. Storage lockers, big earner at Lake Brunner. There are storage lockers in the Cockies paddock. Everyone who owns a house in Lake Brunner has got a Malibu boat sitting in a storage locker. It's fantastic. Um, you've got to engage to be helped. So if you don't engage, you're not going to help yourself. There's no point in sitting there waiting for someone else to help you. You've got to get out and do it for yourself. Um, and if you do engage, then you've got a good chance of getting ahead or being aware of the regulation that's coming and how you might mitigate it. Um, change, I reckon that's around best practice, practice and technology uptake. And we do have to acknowledge that best practice changes as we go on. I mean, our forebearers... They made the best decisions with the information they had at the time. We've now got a new set of information, so we're making different decisions, but they're only as good as today with the information that we have. And finally, um, get involved outside the farm gate. Um, whether that's feds, beef and lamb, 
whatever, filling out a survey, going to meetings, it, it doesn't matter, just get involved. Because uh, it's a bit like voting in my opinion, if you don't vote, don't bitch about the outcome. Um, and then I'd also throw in there that uh, grassroots involvement right from the start of any process gives the best outcomes for us. So by getting involved, we're actually helping ourselves. I mean, I know it's easier for you to say your mates can do it, and, or I don't pay my Fed's, feds um, membership, but um, my mate does and I get the same benefits, and that is true, but yeah, collectively we're stronger than we are individually. Anyway, that's enough out of us. Um, any questions for him? Yeah. Just a couple of minutes for questions. So you know, should, should have talked longer. <laughs> yeah, I told you. Why, why do you dara? Why do you dara? So, effectively, we've gone through and looked at the top of land. We've got limited choices of what will grow there. It's a dry, northerly, mongrel face that has limited topsoil. So, rather than look at one species, we wanted a mix of species. The dara is quite a hardy, high-value alternate species. That's where we ended up on that one for that side. What is Diodara? Himalayan um, cedar. So it's a white grained, pretty timber. <coughs> but it is, I mean, it's a gamble. It's a, I mean, if we were straight trying to make money, pines there all day. But I understand that does swear at a lot of people. But um, the short version is if you start crunching the numbers, pines pay the bills. Which is why we've put in, or are putting in 40 to 50 hectares of pines to. Um, I suppose, allow us to do all the native planting and, and the other species. Um, yeah, so, um, ask, track down Evan and Linda if you, if you want Here to we are around, ask so this and, and yeah. ask them any other questions. But thank you, Evan and Linda. Um, it was a great opportunity to look at your farming operation and your environmental journey you've been on. Been on. Your success through common sense farming is a great example of what can be achieved, um, and your integrated farming system also represents what I believe is the future of New Zealand farming. Um, please accept uh, this gift. And could everyone put their hands together um, for everyone?